Good morning, and um, welcome you to Friday, the end of another week. And uh, you know, the reminder to me of every end of a week is how brief our life is, and how, like James says, our life's but a vapor that appears for a little while, vanishes away. And um, the little phrase in the Bible that it came to pass, and the reminder that that uh, life life goes quickly. And if you're in a, a difficult time today, it will come to pass. And, and like a Friday comes, it's the end of the week. And um, this burden you're carrying, it's going to end. And uh, you might think, I don't know if this is ever going to go away. If you're saved, it's going to go away as soon as the trumpet sounds. Or if the Lord chooses to take you home before the rapture. But our burdens are going to be gone. And uh, the end of the week, it's just a reminder. And then Monday comes. And, the, and Monday's a reminder of a fresh start. And uh, let's get up, whatever happened before, let's get up and get going. Let's have our life count for God. And uh, there's a lot of daily and weekly reminders, things that will keep us fresh, fresh for God. I have my, uh, my book of this day in Baptist history, and it's so timely. I wanted to read you a story that fits very well with where we are, especially in California, but in, in our country in general. Um, and this is about the first Baptist church in New Hampshire. And it's in um, mid-1750 to 1755 in that era. And some of the dates are a little blurred, and you'll see why. It says, though there are some questions to the date of the founding of the First Baptist Church in New Hampshire, there's no doubt that Newtown, or Newton, was its location. The first record of the church and book, uh, the first record on the church books is October 1st, 16, or 1767. We know nothing concerning the first days of the history of the church um, other than the fact that it was under attack by the standing order from the state church. Um, so what was going on in this day, if you have not heard me teach on this, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Congregational Church, when the, the, the people began to settle in America before there were colonies, they came to America and the crown claimed all of America. They, they just said, I own it all. It's really great. They never occurred to them they might have to buy it or there might be someone else who owned it. But uh, there's a lot of arrogance in, uh, in mankind. And um, so the, uh, they declared what people who were coming to America, uh, they came from a place of great religious persecution and, and tyranny where the church and the state were married. And uh, the church, if you didn't do what the church wanted, the state, the, the church state powers were joined so the state could arrest you, imprison you, whatever it might be. And uh, so freedom of religion, uh, people, people grumble about some problems in our early America. There's a lot of problems we had in early America. And little by little, we began to conquer those problems and get over them. Uh, we didn't just one day show up in America, uh, divide up 13 colonies, write up a Declaration of Independence, write up a Bill of Rights, and suddenly change the hearts of all men. That's stupid. Uh, that couldn't happen. It never did happen. But the idea, the dream in one of our classes at our school, I have our boys going through the Gettysburg Address, and you go through, um, our nation was built on some principles, dreams, some ideas, that we were trying to put those ideas and dreams into practice and into the hearts of men. Just because something's true doesn't mean we're all ready to embrace that truth and practice that truth. Well, if you weren't, if you were a Baptist, a Quaker, or a Separatist in the early days of America, um, you could be jailed, you could be banished, chased out of the towns into the wilderness, you could be put in stocks and punished. And we, there was not a lot of li religious liberty in this wonderful free land. It, the idea was there, and freedom was coming. And uh, the, the, the persecution of Bible-believing people was great uh, from the very beginning. And so um, the, there were minutes that were taken. And um, there's three men who were appointed for the oversight. And these minutes they found in uh, 1767 regarding that these three men were in charge of making sure the, the pastor's wages were gathered. Because the Anglican Church, the Church of England... It was paid through tax money, and so each area was required to pay taxes, and from the taxes, the minister received a huge salary. They were not little cottages, you know, where the pastor lived in a church-owned parsonage or a little shack. 
these people, they own plantations. And if you were an ordained minister of the Church of England and you came over to America, you were going to live high on the hog. That's why it was a big deal when Roger Williams was sent to America uh, to be a, a Church of England uh, pastor, uh, minister here. And along the way, he, through the suffering of the Baptists and, and the writing um, of writings of some of the men in prison, uh, and I, I spoke on that some months ago, but uh, Roger Williams changed, and he pretty well became a, he at least knew infant baptism was wrong, he knew underwater baptism was right, and he knew baptism should be for believers only. And so when he made these changes, he forfeited a huge amount of money and a very lucrative career. Um, his, his faith meant something to him. And it's sad in America today how few people um, would put their faith above their finances, how few people would put their faith above their career and their career advancement. In our church, I do know several people who've had opportunities to take promotions, to go work very lucrative jobs elsewhere, and they said, no, this is where I'm going to church, is where I ra I'm raising my kids. And that's huge because, number one, they're choosing faith over finances. And number, and number two, they're choosing California over <laughs> more free places. And I think, wow, you're serious. And uh, thank God for people who are serious about their faith. So um, they had the, the church, had the people of the community had to raise tax money. And that's what paid the, the approved state minister's salary. But they weren't going to go to that church. Then they had to raise money in addition to that to pay the Baptist preacher's salary. And it was hoped in the case of Mr. Stewart, Mr. Carter, uh, they could have settled these early things. And uh, this is now all the way up into 1770. So this is two or three years later, and there's some time slots that were left open there. And they think it's probably because of the persecution and when the church was able to meet. One historian writes, it is as refreshing as a breeze from their own mountains to find so much human granite in this little band of New Hampshire Baptists. They refused to support a state church by force. So these Baptists weren't going to pay their taxes to pay for the state church. They just refused. Well, that's going to cost them. Um, and they chose to support their own pastor cheerfully. Such a church deserves to live, and it exists today. The work of the Baptists in New Hampshire grew very slowly following the establishment of the church in Newton. In his centennial address, William Lamson concluded his remarks by saying, so this is a quote from the 100th year anniversary, unquestionably, the constant persecution and repeated litigation to which the Baptists were subject in those years had much to do in retarding their growth in New Hampshire. The standing order believed that it was the church of God and that it was truly serving God and compelling Baptists and other separatists into conformity. So the state church, they believe they are doing the work of God to force the Baptists and other separatists to conform to the Church of England. That's baptizing babies and that's not reading your Bible. It was against the law to read the Bible. It's against the law for the pastor to stand in a pulpit and read the Bible. They had a, the, the Book of Common Prayers that was approved by the Church in England. That's all a minister could read. And the common man, you better not be caught reading the Bible, especially not reading it to friends and sharing the gospel on the street. Some of these Baptists, they were they're, they're, they were in court, and the prosecuting attorney said, a man cannot pass them on the street without them ramming some text of Scripture down their throats. And that was what they were being accused of. You know what they were? They were street soul owners. They were people out on the streets witnessing. These Baptists were, and they were in jail for it. And that was a lot, and a lot of them in Virginia. And there's reasons for that, and God used those things. But that's what he's talking about here, this standing order. And the church felt like they were doing, the Church of England felt like they were doing the work of God. The state church, by making these Baptists and making these separatists um, conform. And, and it said as they were in their prayer closet or to worship in the sanctuary, they were scattered all over the state. There may have been many of our faith who were longing and praying for the time when they should be permitted to worship God and obey his ordinances with none to molest or make them afraid. But the difficulty under the circumstances of sustaining churches deterred them from becoming organized. They were as sheep 
not having a shepherd. And the Baptists have, have ever maintained that the government has only to do with the collection of taxes, the protection of its citizenry, and the punishment of criminals who break the law, and that the separation of the church and state alone guarantees the freedom of worship. These principles are true and must ever characterize Baptist life and thought. And those ideas, those principles, that the state has no business meddling in the church. Now, separation of church and state doesn't mean you can't have a cross on public property or the White House can't have a nativity scene on the front lawn. Separation of church and state means the state cannot compel any of its citizens to any religious belief that the state has to be separate from religion to not that it, it has to be separate from any religious activity because the Capitol building, they had church for many years in the Capitol. Our founders had no intention of pulling religion out of uh, our government. What they did have the intention of doing was making sure government did not compel anybody to a certain type of religion. That's why the First Amendment talked about the free exercise. Congress shall make no law. Uh, making people do things or keeping people from doing things. This free exercise of religion, it was huge. And in that those early days, um, the, there would be somebody in charge and there would be rotating pastors from different churches and different faiths in the Capitol building. And uh, religion was a huge part of our early American life. But those Baptists in New Hampshire, they were scattered, many of them around the state, but it was with fear that they met. They might pray in a bedroom, pray in a closet, meet secretly, and they all longed for the day when they could meet openly and unmolested by the state church. And you know where we sit today, at least in California and much of America, we are being molested by the state church. The state church that says you can riot, but you can't rejoice. The state church that says you can burn buildings, but you cannot baptize converts. Uh, the state church that says you can have a thousand people on the street protesting the government or protesting uh, President Trump, but you can't have 500 people in a church auditorium peacefully assembling to preach and to pray and to sing. Uh, that's the state church. The state church, they've got no business meddling with your religion and your faith, and they cannot tell you what to do, and they can't tell you what not to do. And that is huge in the foundation of America. Now, of course, this liberal crowd in America today, they want to rewrite the Constitution. They want to throw the Constitution out. They want to throw out the Bill of Rights. And if you think you've seen some injustice in America in your lifetime, you wait and see what happens. If the liberals in America are capable of winning the political power and throwing out the Constitution, do you trust that this crowd can't even report uh, covid test results without lying, what would they do if they were going to rewrite our, our nation's constitution? What would they do if they're going to write laws without the Ten Commandments? Understand, our, our judicial systems, <coughs> excuse me, is not perfect, but it's the best in the world. And the reason it's the best in the world is it's built upon God's Word and the Ten Commandments. And our foundational laws and principles are all built on the principles and laws from the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And these laws in here gave an evenness and a consistency. And no, they're not perfect because men were implementing them. But it's the greatest in all the world. And uh, hey, this morning, I want you to look over to the book of James. And uh, yesterday I talked a little bit about joy. And I want to follow up on it. I didn't have enough time. I didn't want to take too much time. But while you're looking for the book of James, <clears throat> let me just say, remind you to pray for our country. Pray for our, for our states, for governors, for elections. Pray that God would put the right people in the right place. Pray for mercy. We just need mercy. And our country doesn't deserve any help from God. We've murdered countless babies. We've thrown the Bible out of our schools. We've thrown God in prayer, the Bible out of our political circles. And we've, we've outlawed God in countless areas. And uh, to be honest, we deserve to be thoroughly judged. But in mercy... If perhaps God would give us a little window of time that we might start more churches, win more souls, send more missionaries around the world, send more of our money around the world. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have the promise of anything. We, we have merited none of God's favor. What we have is just a cry for mercy because the Bible says God is ever merciful. 
and lendeth and oh I want to I want God's mercy I want to see my children and grandchildren grow up and, and work in a nation that's free and we're soul winning and bus routes you know the the idea that we that we can't run our buses you know right now with COVID this situation is another story but prior to that California made a law through the EPA that uh, these buses after a certain year couldn't run over a thousand miles a year and um, so the school districts they just trashed their buses and took tax money and bought all new buses they've got a giant deep pocket to dig out of but what do churches do and we can't just go buy new buses and uh, I'm, I'm looking uh, now we're gonna <clears throat> our shuttles that we raised money for last year year and a half ago those are legal but our, our buses, basically, we, we're we going to need to sell our buses for whatever we can get. And we're going to need to buy new ones. And I'm, I'm not sure what they're going to cost now. Someone asked me this week, and I'm thinking twenty to $30,000 a piece. I don't know that, but we're going to look into it. But we're just going to patiently raise money for a bus and start running it. And then we'll take our time, raise money for another bus, and start running that. But the need is great. Um, and it's none of the church, the, the state's business, but back to the buses. It was interesting when they told us, the churches, that we could only drive a thousand miles a year. They said, but in the state of California, there is an exception. If you are a uh, in the farm labor camps up and down the central, the San Joaquin Valley where the farming is, if you have a bus that you're running uh, up and down the freeway from farm to farm and you're shuttling your farm workers, those buses are exempt. So go figure that out. Tell me that's not a government messing with religion and they've got their own tax money to buy new public school bus buses but but uh, this is a crooked thing and again don't panic it is crooked government's always been crooked it's the government that uh, through daniel in the lion's den and it's the government that had and a wicked woman that had joseph in prison god's good but uh, let's just be sure we understand there's a lot of injustice in this world and we're not going to panic over injustice we're not going to hate people over injustice we're not going to go try and burn down somebody's buildings over injustice. The world's an unjust place. Suck it up. God's good. And, uh, and, and, and we can make it through this. Of course there's injustice. You, you get married, there's injustice. You play a sporting event, any kind of ball game with referees, there's injustice. You go try to get a building permit, there's injustice. We, let's don't pretend that men are going to create a just a situation. When Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom, now there'll be perfect justice. But until then, it's going to be a mess. So let's just rejoice in the Lord. And that's why I wanted to be here for a minute in James and a couple other verses. In James chapter 1, it's familiar to most of you. Um, he says in verse 2 of James 1, My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So we're talking about joy. And I said yesterday, if you didn't get to hear um, the morning moments from Thursday, that joy, most of the time you find joy in the scriptures, it's joy internally, not externally, and it has to do with something long-term. And here, he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The joy in our trial, you're in a trial today, our country's in a trial, but and countries don't have this promise, but but the people of God have this promise. And the promise that that when we're in this trial, Romans chapter five, by the way, has a similar uh, passage where uh, that the tribulation works patience and patience experience experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. So count it all joy. We've got these tribulations that come. Why do we count it joy? Not that we enjoy the tribulation, not that we enjoy the injustice, not that we enjoy the ugly treatment. You count it all joy that let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We count it joy when we're struggling because if we handle this thing the way God wants us to handle it, we will be better equipped to serve God and to serve others. We, uh, we have joy today internally while we are suffering. Yesterday, talked about 1 Peter chapter 1, where it says, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. There's three things, need and heaviness and manifold temptation. But, but those trials that come, why would we have joy? Because I know like a weightlifter lifting those weights, those big muscles right there, 
you get those muscles by lifting weights. And spiritually, we, we carry these burdens and the load of difficulty weighs on our shoulders. And so we've got these burdens and we carry them. We count it all joy. Why? Because we let that patience have her, because tribulation works patience. And he says, um, um, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So I have this burden, I have this, you have this trial. And we count it joy because you know what? I'm going to walk with God through this thing. And I'm going to handle this thing right like a child of God should. And as I come through the other side, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be able to serve God better, serve people better. Job said, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So there's this long-term benefit. Joy is not a birthday party. It's not getting a new car. That's happiness. Joy is that thing deep down inside that you say, you know what? It's going to be good. Wait and see. Wait and see. This is all going to turn out. Now, it, and it, we may not see it on earth. It may be in heaven as we looked at some verses yesterday. It may be eternal. We'll see that again in a minute. But the joy that, that God is working in us, that this patient, the trial brings patience and the patience works on us and that makes us perfect and entire, wanting nothing so that I've got everything I need to go into whatever God's got for me to do next. So uh, look with me over to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, just a couple of their thoughts on this matter of, um, <coughs> excuse me, of joy. Matthew chapter 5. And if you look at Matthew chapter 5 and down at verse 10, Matthew 5 and verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice. There's the joy. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so we've got men reviling you. We've got men persecuting you. We've got people saying all manner of evil falsely against you. And, uh, you know, people will say something ugly and uh, put it on social media and they'll slander and ridicule my I'm so sick of this culture we're in here where people feel they have the liberty to destroy people's names and reputations on social media. Everybody's become judge and, and, and prosecutor and attorney and, uh, and uh, execution. You're the judge and the jury and the executioner. And people feel they have this right. And I spoke about it a few weeks ago, or a few days ago, what a criminal thing it is. How God forbids that kind of thing. That is so very wrong. And, uh, but, but he says, you know what, you're going to, it's going to happen because it's a corrupt world. And he said, I want you to rejoice. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. You're not rejoicing that people are lying about you. You're not rejoicing that you've been treated unjustly. You are determined to handle it in a God-fearing, godly way, in a Christian manner. So, <coughs> excuse me, so that your reward is great in heaven. The joy is is that I happen to know my retirement is set. I am not only on my way to heaven, but the ugly treatment that comes my way, I'm going to commit that to God. I'm going to treat it as a gift from heaven. And I am going to. I might cry. I'm, I'm human. I've got flesh. But I'm going to rejoice because I know this. Great is your reward in heaven. Look over to the book of Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew, as soon as I get talking, then my... Horse, my my um, horse gets throaty. And uh, Acts chapter 5, I have not had a cup of tea here for a while. Acts chapter 5, and look down at verse 41. These guys had been arrested in Acts chapter 5. They were preaching, and they got arrested, and they got beaten. Uh, and they didn't call a bunch of attorneys. They didn't, they didn't go pout and quit going to church. I'm done with church because religious people are so bad. Of course, religious people are bad. They're people. And... Um, it was the religious people that crucified Jesus, or at least brought him to the Romans to be crucified. And uh, they didn't quit on God, and they didn't walk away and give up on their faith. And so here in Acts chapter 5, <clears throat> a lot of struggling going on. And they were verse 40, Acts, Acts 5, 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. Uh, they command, they beat him and said, don't have church in your building anymore. They beat him and said, don't sing. They beat him and said, you got to wear a mask. You can't go to church and, and sing and praise God. And, 
and uh, you put it into whatever context you want to. In verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they didn't, they weren't about to quit preaching Christ. Verse, the very next verse, verse 42, and daily in the temple and house, in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. These people said, you go ahead and beat us and we're just going to go preach some more. They committed their suffering to God. They figured God knew what was going on. And they didn't like the hurt. They wouldn't choose the hurt. But God wasn't dead. God knew they were going through this trial. And they felt like they were suffering for Jesus' sake. And what a, what a great privilege that we could do this. Romans 5, I mentioned a minute ago that um, I wanted you to look at Romans 5. And uh, <clears throat> early in Romans 5, it, it's a parallel passage to James 1. But later in Romans chapter 5, down at verse 17, I'm sorry, not Romans 5, it's Romans 8. I'm looking at my notes there. Romans 5 is the parallel to James 1. And, uh, but uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, Romans 8, 17, talking about us being heirs of God and an heir, meaning we inherit. And if children, the, I mean, verse 17 of Romans 8, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may, may be glor that we may be glorified, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon, he's a southerner, for I reckon, I'm in, in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. Glory. This, you know, it's going to be a glorious day, a wonderful day of rejoicing when, when we get to see him. And if we go through some hard times here on earth for his name's sake, I don't mean you rob a bank and you go to jail. I mean you're trying to do right. and You're trying to live the Christian life. And, and uh, people attack you and you get blamed for something you didn't do. And some injustice comes along that was nothing to do with you, your work or your home or whatever it might be, and some wrong happens, and you just say, you know what? I'm going to keep loving God. I want to keep doing right. And there's a joy because he says that the great, uh, the, the things that are about to be revealed, he said that we may be glorified together, for I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of, which shall be revealed in us. There's going to be something so wonderful, so incredible uh, in, the, in, in our future. And, and the, the suffering of this present time, it doesn't even deserve to be compared. It's not worthy to be compared with the joy that shall be revealed in us. That's why witness, read your Bible, take time in prayer, be faithful to church, tell people about Christ, invite people to church, Forgive those who hate you. That's Christian. That's Bible. Work hard on your job. Be honest in your dealings. When people are dishonest with you, be honest in return. You see, this Christian life, when we suffer, when we go through hard times, the Bible says that great is your reward in heaven. And so joy, it's not about the day. It's not about me. I saw, I don't even know who it was or what it was, but I saw a little headline. Somebody got in trouble for driving 180 miles an hour in his Ferrari. I think, well, if you have a Ferrari, you've got to at least try to drive it fast. And, uh, but uh, he, he was speeding and he got a ticket, or I don't know what you get, probably get more than a ticket for driving 180 miles an hour. But, uh, but joy is not getting a Ferrari given to you. That's happy. Happy is this giddy outside roller coaster up and down. It's your birthday, blow out the candles, eat too much cake and ice cream. That's happy. Joy is saying, man, it's going to be good. This is going to be good. And my body may be frail and weak, but I'll tell you there's a new one coming. And my mind may be a little slower than it used to be. And uh, But you know what? There's a bright day coming. And I, I'm going to lay aside this old flesh and I'm going to pick up a glorified body. And I'll be able to fly around from here to heaven, and, and uh, boy, it's going to be great. And I may be abused here, but you know what? I've got a God in heaven. I'm going to have a city and a mansion. I'm going to have friends beyond description, and I'm going to be able to see Jesus. I'm going to see the nail pierced. And see, that's joy. The joy says, ah, you go ahead. Be ugly to me. I don't like it, and I'm not happy about it, but you know what? You want to be ugly. That's why my goal, Proverbs 4, 
Keep thy heart with all diligence. My goal is to love and to care for people. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it and I may get hurt bad enough or those I love might get hurt enough that, that I get ugly and I hope I don't, but I'm flesh and I might. But uh, the, the way we ought to respond is to, to commit our trials to God and then look forward to the reward. I mean, just like you go to work and you work eight hours, you get a paycheck. Or you work 40 hours or 100 hours, whatever, and you get a paycheck. And so I suffer a little and I think, yeah, paycheck's coming. Somebody's ugly, paycheck's coming. Somebody lies about me or you, paycheck's coming. Some injustice on the job, paycheck's coming. Why do we take those things patiently? Because great joy in here knowing paycheck's coming. I'll share a quick illustration. When I was in college, uh, I'd been working through the end of my high school and, and up in the first couple years of college for the Forest Service. Worked in the woods and, <coughs> and uh, I did a lot of um, salvage stuff, dead trees and dying trees, diseased trees, getting them out of the woods before the disease spread. And um, uh, kind of a transitional time in forestry. And uh, it was a good job. I was outside a lot. I loved working in the woods. I loved being outdoors. And I got to work with some real smart people. I was just a kid. But uh, I worked and enjoyed it. <clears throat> and uh, But once in a while, I just got a normal paycheck, nothing special. Uh, but my 40 hours, whatever it might be, but on occasion, there'd be a fire. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't on a fire crew. I didn't go to the forest fires. But when something was out of control, they just needed human beings. They needed bodies that were already on the payroll. And um, I remember getting home from work one day, and, and I could drive around a couple of miles around, uh, kind of a roundabout way to get to my home. But if I didn't mind crossing a little creek, I could walk home and get home quicker walking than driving. And so I'd, get, I'd walk down the road to the creek take off my shoes and socks, roll up my pants and wade real careful across the water and put my shoes and socks back on. I was in the house because our property bordered the little stream and uh, I and I could get right across to work and as long as I didn't mind my feet getting cold. And um, so here I was uh, one day, I'd gotten off work, already worked my eight hour shift and um, and I walk across the stream, get home and I'm just putting my shoes back on and getting and maybe well, we had a couple of acres, so it was a little bit of a walk from the stream. And I'm just getting up to the house, and the phone rings. And it's the guys across the stream. They said, hey, can you come? We're flying a helicopter load of people out there for a fire. There's an there's a out-of-control forest fire. And um, I said, sure. So I turned around and walked. I had been off the clock half hour. And I turned around and I took my boots off, walked across the stream, put my boots back on, walked back over there, and met up. And I was on the clock just like that. So immediately I was on overtime, so I was already, already over my eight hours. And since the fire was out of control, you got paid time and a half for overtime, you got paid time and three quarters for hazard pay because of an out of control fire. And so I get over there, I'm on the clock, and we had to wait several hours for the helicopter. Government work is so efficient. And they called us all over, and then they started looking for a helicopter. And they come over and they get us in the helicopter, and they fly us all the way up north of Reading, it's a long ways where we went to up in, it was in the Modoc area. And they fly us up there and, and bring us right into a, a, a landing area they'd cut out near where the fire's going on. And it was, it was late at night, like midnight, by the time we got to where the fire was. So I got off at probably four or four thirty, whatever, back on the clock at five. And next seven hours, I'm on time and three quarters, hazard pay, overtime, and, I, and all I'd done is flown in a helicopter. I could have paid a couple hundred dollars for that cool helicopter ride. And I get up there and uh, slept in a paper sleeping bag and worked the next two, three, four days, you know, tw basically 24-hour shifts and and um, and sleep whenever you can sleep and up on the, you know, mountains, you know, so, so steep you, you couldn't hardly walk. And, uh, and, then they, and then fly me back home. Well, I'll tell you, I was looking forward to that paycheck because I got my normal 40 hour paycheck week after week. And I knew what that was about like, but I thought, I don't even know how big this paycheck's going to be. And you know what it did inside? There was this anticipation. This is going to be so great. And you know what? Right where you and I are today, we're living for God where some of us are on hazard pay. Uh, some of you are carrying a burden. And carry it as a child of the king. Might be a health problem, might be a marriage problem. Maybe you're married to somebody who's 
who's uh, just not walking the walk and it's a burden to you. It might be broken hearts, might be whatever. But uh, uh, God rewards us for handling our burdens as a child of God should handle them. Uh, they're, sure, there's rewards for soul winning. There's rewards for preaching. There's rewar rewards, unique rewards for the pastor. But there's rewards for people who suffer faithfully. There are rewards for people who take persecution and, and, and trust God in it. So all these different reasons, the crowns the Bible calls them, and all these different reasons. And so, you know what? You're chalking up rewards. And, and, and it's like me, one day over time, 24 hours, 48 hours, and uh, you keep chalking up the hours and you think, you know, I don't even know what that paycheck's like when I get home, but is it going to be great? And I'll tell you, the payday's coming for the child of God. Let's be faithful. And, the, and joy is what you have down here. Now, I'm on that forest fire. I hadn't changed clothes for three days. Dirty, sooty, ashes, sweaty, too cold. The fire was so hot, you're sweating yourself to death, worried you're going to burn your hair off your face. And then, and then you'd get the area, maybe the fire knocked down a little bit, and it would get so cold, you'd want to start a fire to keep from freezing up in those mountains. And think, I don't know what's worse, burning up or freezing. But all the time, the joy down in here, because I've got the best paycheck ever coming in. And so do you as a child of God. So joy, it's a wonderful thing, and it's ours. And it, it, it's not about what we have today. It's about our tomorrow. And uh, let's trust him. Let's live for him, honor him. Let's have a pray for a good weekend. Pray for our soul winning tomorrow morning. Pray for our other services. We have Brother Dennis Coral going to be with us Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night. Monday night, we've got a special men's service, just the teenage and adult men. He'll be, be Brother Dennis Coral will be speaking on the importance of men in the country, the church, and the home, and how desperately we need strong men. Hey, have a great weekend and take time with God, take time with your family, and let's rejoice. God's awfully good to us.